Whitecap, or Wapahaska, as he was known in his own language, was the chief of a small band of Dakotas who had journeyed from the USA to Canada. The Dakotas had a long history of loyalty to the British Crown. After the American War of Independence, there were a series of conflicts between the Dakotas and the U.S. Cavalry when the American government refused to honor the treaties made under the colonial government. These battles culminated with the infamous Custer's Last Stand. Wapahaska and his young warriors defeated Custer and his troops. But as a result, they had a price placed on their heads by the U.S. Cavalry. As a result, Wapahaska led his band across the border into British territory, safe from the vengeful U.S. Cavalry. John Nielsen Lake was a successful pastor, revivalist, and leader of the uh, temperance movement in Toronto. He was born in 1834, and his family had strong roots in the Methodist Church. Like many in the Lake family, John grew up with a strong desire to be used of God to see his kingdom expanded in the earth. John entered ministry at the time when the Methodist Church was beginning to shift. The church was beginning to see social issues as the outworking of the move of the Spirit in their revival-based camp meetings and services. John's passion for revival led him to call his congregation to get outside the walls of the church and help those struggling with addiction and poverty. This led to a deep involvement with the temperance movement. In 1881, at the age of 47, John was woken up in the middle of the night with a dream to head west to found a city whose builder and maker was God. Just like Abraham, he would go not knowing where he was going. Fired by his dream, John went and shared it with the churches in Toronto. Over the next couple of months, the churches of Toronto raised $4 million dollars. He used this money to start the Temperance Colonization Society, which eventually bought over two million acres of land from the Dominion government. In the summer of 1882, John Lake and his company of 10 explorers reached the land then known as the Northwest Territories. Although there was settlement in both northern and southern Saskatchewan, the land around the South Saskatchewan River was empty except for rumors of a tribe of Dakotas that had migrated from the United States. The Dakotas were a fierce tribe that had fled to Saskatchewan after their massacre of American settlers at Custer's infamous last stand. In Lake's journal, he tells, describes the journey west. When they began exploring the area around the Saskatchewan River, John placed a heavy emphasis of the Sunday church and the prayer services him and his band of explorers held. John Nielsen Lake believed the hand of God was upon their company, and he believed that as they followed God's direction, they were literally being used by God to prophetically birth a settlement that would grow into a city that would be used in the end time move of God. They believed that as they prayed, that their words were, that they were speaking forth the purposes of God in birthing this city. One week before they reached the place where Saskatoon was to be founded, John Lake and his team of ministers and explorers held a church service on the bank of the Saskatchewan River. In this service, John Lake preached as much to the prophetic destiny upon Saskatoon as he did to the men with him. Out of Acts 3.19, Lake prophesied that the settlement they would build would become a place of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. He stated here in his journal that the dream God had given him was that this city was to become a place where settlers and natives alike could join together at the well of revival that would become the city of Saskatoon, and that it would be known as a place of God's presence and a well for the nation." It was at this time that God brought Whitecap to Lake's company of travelers. In the middle of John Lake's services, Wapahaska rode up and asked him and his band of explorers what they were doing. Because of the stories that they had heard about Custer's last stand, sub several of the explorers were apprehensive. However, John Nielsen Lake told Chief, Chief Wapahaska that they were worshiping the Creator and his son Jesus. Wapahaska and a couple of his warriors listened with interest through the rest of the service. After the service, Wapahaska told the company that he would lead them to a location for a settlement. 
they finally arrived at a location of Saskatoon on Friday, August 18th. On Sunday, the team of explorers gathered together to hold another service, the first service in what is now Saskatoon. At the end of this open-air church service, John Nielsen Lake once again prophesied over Saskatoon. Standing over the banks of the river and looking down the Miwasan Valley, he proclaimed, Arise, Saskatoon, Queen of the North. He then referenced Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Once again, John Lake spoke of the prophetic call to raise up a city that would not be founded for either educational or economic reasons. Saskatoon was to be a city founded solely for spiritual reasons. In the dream God had given John Lake, Saskatoon would grow to be a city set apart for the purposes of God in the end times revival. It would be a place free from alcohol and other addicting substances. It would be a place where white settlers and First Nation people would come together to worship the Creator and His Son. Out of this radical unity between two different cultures, John Lake believed that Saskatoon would be a city of justice, and out of justice would grow the move of God. Out of the first meeting between Wapahaska and John Nielsen Lake, a relationship was started between the settlers who came to Saskatoon and the First Nations people who were already here. John Lake was able to lead Chief Wapahaska to faith in Christ. Within several months, it was arranged for a missionary to be sent to the band. Wapahaska became a pastor and leader to his people. For the rest of his life, he spoke of how Jesus finally brought peace to the heart of a warrior. During the Riel Rebellion of 1885, the Métis tried to get the Wapahaska band to join them. At the beginning of the conflict, Wapahaska assured the settlers that his band would not join the Métis. He refused to join the conflict because it was the settlers who brought the light of the gospel to his band. In April, about 40 Métis surrounded Whitecap and his warriors, and at gunpoint forced them to join the uprising. That night, after Wapahaska was informed of the plans to massacre the innocent families of Saskatoon, Wapahaska and his warriors escaped under the cover of darkness to warn the citizens of Saskatoon. The next day, when the Métis marched on Saskatoon, they found the warriors arm-in-arm arm with the men of Saskatoon guarding the settlement. Because the element of surprise was taken away from the Métis, they skirted Saskatoon, and no battle was fought here. Saskatoon continued to grow as a temperance colony set aside for the purposes of God, and the relationship between the settlers of Saskatoon and the First Nations people flourished. <laughs>